Hello my dears! Welcome to my small detail painting tutorial, the name of which I have yet to actually settle on and probably will after I finally record this. But thank you so much for joining me. It means all the worlds to me and thank you so much for your support. It would not be possible for me to make this extra content if not for you. You guys are helping me literally achieve my dreams and improve my life and myself and I just hope I can return the favor because I can't put into words how much it means to me. Real quick, I'm sorry if you can hear all the noise in the background. It's incredibly busy on the street outside 24 hours a day. It's the one small, small setback of this studio. As much as I love this studio, that's a tiny little problem I've got with it that I'm hoping maybe I can remedy somehow. Maybe some really big fluffy curtains over my huge like sliding glass doors to kind of keep some of that sound out. But hopefully it doesn't bother you too much. If you have any questions or comments regarding this video or my technique, please feel free to leave them in the comment section and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. I want to know always what you're interested in seeing next, so please never hesitate to ask me like, hey Arya, could you maybe think about doing a tutorial on this or could you possibly cover this in a future video because I'm always writing down ideas and honestly, I could use your help in tempering my ideas. I think I have so many and maybe some of them would be incredibly boring or just, I don't know, I, I get too many ideas. Does that happen to you where you just want to do all the things but there's absolutely no time? Of course it does, that's life, right? So your feedback helps me immensely in being able to kind of temper my wild mind and focus in on stuff that would be actually useful for you. Without further ado, let's get to painting. I hope you enjoy this tutorial and I'll see you again at the end. Bye! All right, let us get started. First off, all the materials used in the making of this tutorial will be listed in the description, so feel free to check those out. I also want to mention that these paintings are sped up to avoid the video being too long. The first painting took about one and a half hours in real time, the next one took about 25 to 30 minutes, and the last one about 20 to 25 minutes. I do not always spend so much time on small details when I'm working within a larger painting, However, I was admittedly nervous about doing my first tutorial for you and I was being a bit overcautious and taking all my time. So let's go over some of the basics of painting small or fine details in general. This painting is not too unreasonably small, this first one here, um, for me personally. However, I know some artists who are more comfortable working a lot larger, so I thought this might be a good starting size to use for this tutorial, and I'll gradually go smaller as the tutorial goes on. With this size, you can still accomplish quite a lot, so I chose to make it more challenging by doing everything using the same three colors, and those are the ochre yellow, deoxazine violet, and then my hand-mixed quote-unquote black which actually contains those colors as well as a couple of others. And I thought it would force me to rely on something that I feel is deeply important to making details stand out and is just deeply important in art as a general rule, and that is values. Values are your light and dark shades, and they help bring out the character and our focal details and make them more dynamic. This is something that will be a repeating trend throughout this tutorial because I personally feel it is one of the biggest helps in making things more clear and understandable within my work. So as this goes on, I'm going to be talking a little bit and then occasionally I'll just let it go dim when I'm doing areas like this where I'm just kind of filling in background and I'll just kind of let Curtis's lovely music play during those parts and pop in now and then to kind of announce what I'm doing. But again, feel free if you have any questions to ask them in the comments. I would be happy to respond. And if you want to see me go more in depth on anything that's covered here, let me know. I would be really happy to maybe do some more videos along these specific lines of painting small detail because it's kind of a tricky topic and I think you can never have enough information. So just let me know. 
So what I'm doing here is obviously just filling in the background. For this kind of background, I decided to do kind of a lot of texture. It's very abstract. I didn't try to do a specific environment or anything. You know, I love my nature and environments, and you see a lot of that within my work. But for this small piece, I didn't want to do anything crazy like that. I just wanted to do a bunch of background textures with this little fox almost kind of ghosting her way in. And still standing apart from the background, but kind of having a little bit of that camouflage feeling as well. So that's where the value situation is going to come in and here in a little bit where I talked about bringing the character out from the background. At first I just kind of start with my bases where I go over the whole background, do some texturing, and then I go back over the character using a lot of those same colors. You'll note that on the character I use a little bit more of the ochre than I do on the background, and that's just to help her stand out more. You see that I'm still using the violet colors in her shadows, and I'll go in with a little bit of the black as well, but overall I'm trying to give her a little bit more of a gold color. Uh, fun fact, this girl here is named Opling. She's actually based on a fox I knew in real life who was so beautiful and blind in one eye and incredibly magical, and I'm actually working on a novel for her, just like the little fox Ivan that I usually draw. Some of you know that I've been working on a novel for him for a while now, and she's actually going to have one in the same series as well, along with a third fox named Whispling. So I just kind of wanted to paint her as a part of my upcoming Mountain Kalia show, and I'm going to be framing her in a little wreath I got that's made out of grapevine that I thought would be a cute frame. So you see, I'm just kind of going along, adding in textures and playing, you know, I'm doing a lot of wet on wet techniques here, which means that I'm getting the paper very wet, using a lot of water, and then just kind of dabbing in color, like dipping my brush into a very watered down color and letting it, letting that color do its own thing as it touches the paper. Watercolor is fantastic. I feel half the time that it's smarter than the artist, at least for me. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I think the paint is what gives me so many of my ideas, and that's because it just creates these beautiful textures when you kind of don't try to get so controlling over it, especially in the beginning phases, and you just let it play, let it do its own thing, and then go back in and kind of pull out the details you want. So I highly recommend that if you're working with watercolor, just, especially if you're new to it, just let it be fun. Let yourself play and see what happens. Don't worry about doing a neat and tidy job at first, especially. Like, give yourself room to do a lot of experiments. So now I'm going in and I'm just starting to add in some little details to Miss Oppling the Fox. I'm giving her her black legs like she's got in real life. And what I'll be doing here is just kind of blocking in the colors. And what I mean by that is I'm 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 doing a real rough draft, just kind of not focusing on tons of detail yet, but rather adding in some big reminders to myself. Like here I'm saying, oh, I'm gonna want it a bit darker here, or I need to remember the lines of this section on her body before I cover them up. And you'll see that occasionally I do add small details before I probably really should. I need to make myself block things in before I add those small details, but um, sometimes I get excited and I'll just start adding little details in. And sometimes, honestly, I know those details will probably get destroyed or covered up, but I add them in anyway. Most of the time, as a reminder to myself to redo them later, I know that sounds weird, but I do that a lot where I'll add small details knowing I'll probably destroy them and it kind of serves as a muscle memory reminder to add them back in later. It's really strange. I don't know if any of you do that. I'd be quite curious to find that out because it's kind of a weird and maybe impractical technique of mine, but it's something I've been doing subconsciously and only just recently started to become really aware of it, maybe even when I started doing videos. Um, and sorry, if you keep seeing the random blurry <laughs> levitating paintbrush in the frame, I must have had it tucked into my hair and it kept sticking in the frame. I had to edit my head out of so many frames because I kept sticking it in there trying to take a look at the 
little details and you'll probably see my hair or the very little bit of my head creep in now and then which I apologize for I've got to get better about that but it's so hard not to want to lean in and look at those little details I need to find a better camera angle for when I'm painting this small Here, I'm still just kind of blocking things in little by little. It's very similar to doing a large painting for me where I'll just rough in all those details early on. And you can see that I actually ended up adding a lot more of the violet to her body as I went on, um, especially towards the back because I wanted her to be real shadowy except for on top of her kind of fluffy neck fur where I wanted it to be really bright. I'm not using a ton of light logic here, and what I mean by that is I'm not like trying to make a really evident light source or really accurate light source. I think that's kind of just up to your own preference. Lighting is something I'm trying to make stronger in my work recently, but occasionally when I do a small piece for fun or a piece where I don't feel like I want strong lighting to be the main focus, I won't put quite as much thought into it. Oh, and if you saw me just flicking the brush with my fingertip there, I'm going to talk a lot more about that here in just a little bit. I am constantly touching my brush and rotating it to get the perfect shape and point for the areas that I'm doing. All right, so now we're starting to get into some of the detail work, and that's going to bring me to the point that I just mentioned a minute ago, and that is touch, particularly light touch. So this might be a little confusing to explain, but I'm going to try to talk to you about something I do that I kind of like to call it sweeping, and that is where I will gently sweep over the drawing or painting surface little by little until the tip of the brush touches the surface. And the reason I do it with this sweeping motion is because I'm trying to get the lightest touch possible. If I were to just go in and touch the surface immediately, chances are I would go in with a little bit too much force and I wouldn't be able to get those fine lines. Um, and when you see it zoomed in, those lines are, I feel like they look a little bit thicker but in reality, they're actually usually only a few hairs thick. They're very, very small. And so being able to accomplish that, especially if you're using a brush that's a little bit old or maybe doesn't have the sharpest tip, um, you know, like a little bit of a thicker brush, you're gonna want to use those super light touches in order to accomplish those very, very fine hair thin details. Um, so for instance, I will get the brush wet Okay, sometimes by licking it, but don't do that because you can probably slowly poison yourself over time with your painting mediums. And then I'll use my fingers to gently mold it back into a perfect point. If my brush is getting old and the hairs are starting to curl over or go dull at the tip and I don't have a new one at hand, I will do one of two things. I will either wet the brush and then use my fingers to pinch it tightly squeezing out the water and flattening the brush so that it gets a razor edge I can use at the corners like I would a brush tip. Or I will make it into a point and then turn it in a way so that the sharpest part of the brush is still touching the surface of the drawing. This is very hard to explain, but basically I'm trying to make sure that the finest hairs, even if they've curled and warped, are always turned towards the paper and I'm using an extremely light touch to get them to work. This is why I can sometimes get a high level of detail using a slightly thicker or really dull brush. And 
And actually one of the brushes I used during this was not dull, but she's starting to get there a little bit. I go through brushes like crazy, like I'm always doling out my fine detail brushes. Usually by the end of a painting I will have um, slightly destroyed the tip of one and I'm not entirely sure if it's because of the surface sizes I use, which are kind of like painting on stone almost with the way that I prep them with my watercolor ground, but it seems to really grind the tips of the brush and I've tried really expensive brushes. I've used the real hair brushes and the fake hair brushes and I haven't noticed a difference. And, and if you're wondering what I mean by the real hair and the fake hair, um, a lot of people don't know and I didn't used to know that most or a lot of brushes are made out of real animal hair, which I don't think is really okay. I don't think we should um, kill things just to use them to paint with, but I've been gifted a lot of real hair brushes and I used to buy them because I had no idea that's what they were and I've just never noticed a big difference with the real hair versus the fake hair and I haven't even noticed a huge difference some of the time with the expensive versus the inexpensive. I think at some point I'll do a brush review and try to really uh, nail down what some of the best ones are. Actually though, the ones I'm using, I do quite like them even though I still end up destroying the tips. I find them to be really nice and because I can kind of squish them back into shapes, I'm still able to use them for a while even after the tips get kind of dull. So I always recommend changing your brushes out when they get dull if you're trying to do fine details because you'll end up frustrating yourself so badly otherwise. But if you're in a place where you can't afford to buy a lot of brushes, which I totally understand because it does get expensive, then there are little tips and tricks like I mentioned before to still being able to get a level of detail using kind of a dull brush. Some people actually also choose to go back in with dry mediums like pencil or even like certain kinds of pens, which obviously aren't a dry medium, but can be a little bit easier to maneuver sometimes than a paintbrush for some people. So if that's what you're comfortable with, you can always do that too. I'm not a purist of any sort when it comes to watercolor, so while I don't tend to go back in with pens and pencils, because I tend to paint on um, canvas and wood and have a really textured surface that that doesn't work very well on, if you're painting on something really smooth like paper, then you can go ahead and go back in with those things and accomplish your details that way if you absolutely can't stand painting them. But again, this is just kind of advice on how to do it via paintbrush for those who are interested. Oh, and I, I will say that I actually did paint this, all of these little pieces on paper, but I painted it on a paper that was prepped with a little bit of a mixture of Daniel Smith watercolor ground in titanium white and Q&R watercolor ground in just their, I think it's just their regular one. Again, it'll be, all the materials will be listed in the description. But I wanted to paint it on paper because I knew I'd be cutting them out to fit, um, well, I knew at least for this one, I'd be cutting her out to fit in a frame. And also I just need to use up this paper. I love certain things about this paper, but I'm also not a huge fan. One thing I don't care for with it is that it doesn't lift at all. So. A lot of my technique involves kind of carving the paint back out, especially when I'm doing detail work. And that means I'll kind of take the paintbrush and carve little highlights out of the paint, like I'll scrape up the paint, almost like you would use an eraser. And I'll create highlights that way, but this paper makes it very difficult to do that in my experience. And so that's why I prepped it with some watercolor ground to give it a little bit of a lifting ability, although it's still didn't really lift very well at all and I even tried with the next two paintings not using the watercolor ground and I didn't see a huge difference so I think I would have needed to use a lot more watercolor ground if I wanted to give it more of that lifting effect. But that's okay, it's nice to kind of challenge myself by working on paper now and then because I feel that it gives me ideas to use in my non-paper paintings and also just kind of keeps me on my toes and keeps my skills sharpened a little bit, I guess. So 
you kind of get the basic idea of what I'm doing here. You can see that I've gone in around her tail and I've used some darker shades. And now what I'm doing is I'm using white highlights to kind of make her pop to add a little bit more fur texture and just some fun elements that make her stand out a little bit further from the background. Again, I kind of wanted her to be camouflaging against it a bit, but I didn't want her to look totally camouflaged against it and hidden to where you couldn't see her at all. So that's why I'm going in at the background and adding some shadow around her body and then going in and adding some white highlights. And you can also use lines like line art to bring your pictures out from the background, like to bring your details out. I'm going to discuss that a little bit more at the end because I will be doing that on my little dime sized unicorn that I paint at the end. But for this one, I still kept my line work very minimal because it was at a size where I felt comfortable with not using a lot of line work. You can see here I'm painting these funny little mushrooms that are kind of, I don't know, they're not based on any kind of reality. I just had the idea to give her a little mushroom bouquet. And the reason is that Upling's story has its own little pop color. And what I mean by a pop color is like a color that stands out from the rest. And her color for her story is blue. And I kind of associate her with that color because around the time that I met the real Opling, I also found the feather from a Stellar's Jay. It's a kind of beautiful bluebird. And his color, I decided, would be really neat to just use throughout artwork I do of her. And I also paint him sometimes when I paint her because he plays a role in her book. His name is actually Curious. He's named after a model friend that I've had for years and years. If you if you enjoy beautiful photography and beautiful people, you should definitely look up my friend Kiris because his work is pretty cool. He's got a really unique aesthetic and I think you'll enjoy him. And he reminds me a lot of a Stellar's J, so I named the Stellar's J in this story after him. One thing I did on these mushrooms is that kind of carving thing I mentioned. Often when I do fine lines, I'll try to make them even more fine or a little bit, oh, I don't know how to explain. I'll kind of try to blur them out so that they're a little bit more fine, but also a little less harsh. So I'll go back over with a barely damp brush. I mean, I'll get it wet and then remove almost all the water from it using my fingers, as I mentioned before. And I'll usually turn it into kind of that razor edge again by flattening it. And I'll run it along the side of a line in order to make the line a little bit more fine and also to make it less harsh and sharp. That might not make a lot of sense, but just try it for yourself and you'll see what I mean about the water softening the line. And if you get it running along the edge, it'll also make the line even thinner. So that's a really good way to accomplish sharper details is to draw out the detail and then use a brush to kind of carve the edge of that detail away and it will make it even sharper. I realize that some of these things might be a bit confusing. So again, 
If you want me to go more in depth on a specific thing I mentioned at some point, let me know and maybe I can work it into a live demo at some point or make another video specifically on that subject. And what I'm doing right now is just kind of softening a couple of the background details that I felt were a little bit too harsh. And then I'm just kind of going back in, adding a few more highlights and touch-ups, kind of making things stand out. All those final fun touches you do that make it so that you can call a painting quote-unquote finished. And sorry about my wild hair flying around. I should just pin it back when I paint because I've seen it creep into videos so many times. My hair has a mind of its own and if you ask anyone who knows me, they will tell you the same. It's quite a beast. And with Opling here, I want to mention that I wasn't going for any kind of realism. I wanted a very stylized look. She almost has... I, I don't know why, but there's something about her that reminds me a little bit of traditional Native American imagery a little bit. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but something about it does. And that did used to be a huge, huge influence of mine. So it's kind of fun to see it whatever that influence was creeped back in a little bit. She just, something about her reminds me of that. All right, so she's all done now. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. And this one, as you can see, is going to be the size of a US quarter. That was unintentional at first, but I actually drew the circle, realized it matched up, and thought that would be kind of a fun little comparison. So first, I'm just giving, doing this real simple little drawing of a kind of abstract squirrel, weasel type, little mammal of some sort. And what's going to be unique about this is that I actually paint the character before the background. I wanted to show how adding a striking color can be a great way to help your small details stand out. Near the end of this piece, I'm going to add in some gold, but I did things much differently than I normally do, and I painted the character first. You can go either way, although I often recommend painting the character before you paint the background, because for me personally, I find it easier to layer the character over a more refined background or at least do the details of the character after I have completed a background because then I know what colors I'm working with for the environment and how I can incorporate them into the light and shadows and more easily correct mistakes. Whereas if I paint the background after the character, it can sometimes be more easy to cause it to bleed into the character, especially for me because I use quite a lot of water in my work. But just go with whatever you're comfortable with if you already have a technique that works. And then I always recommend that you try experimenting now and then on a piece at least that you aren't, you know, super afraid of experimenting on. And just try other techniques. See if you can find something new to do. It's always good to, you know, stretch ourselves out and figure out what we can incorporate into our work. Because sometimes we'll get a good idea by doing things we weren't necessarily comfortable doing before. One of the most important things I want to talk about with these really small paintings is the concept of less is more. Adding in the right amount of detail is important for any painting, and for small details, I think this is especially true. I tend to pick over things for quite a long time, and if I'm not careful, I can overdo the detail until it becomes a blob. This piece is an example of something a little bit more simple where I created a much softer, less detailed form for my character than I might normally, and I didn't go overboard with trying to render every muscle, but instead let it be rather stylized and added in the most fine details as a fun after effect to make him feel pretty without getting too complex. So you'll kind of see that I'm just blocking in different shades like I did before. 
I kind of painted him in monochrome first, just using my hand-mixed black, which had a super lavender tint to it. And now I'm just adding more lavenders and blues because I wanted to give him a little bit of a celestial feeling. Now, I very easily could have let myself go for more detail and realism, but I thought it would be better to show something a bit more basic for this specific example. However, if you would like me to do something this size with a lot more detail than this, please let me know and I might just make another video. It would be really fun for me to kind of get in there and see how much I could fit. I would actually enjoy that a lot. So now I'm going in and I'm giving him some little fuzzies and I'm doing a lot of that sweeping technique I talked about in the first part of this tutorial where I'm just very lightly touching the paper, um, sweeping over the top of it with my brush until I gently touch down and that way I can figure out how much pressure I need in order to do those tiny little lines. And what's interesting at this size, when I'm zoomed in this much, is you can see how even by using very little water and doing more of a dry brush, which is, if I didn't mention before, one of the best ways to get those fine details is use very little water. You want your brush to just barely be damp, have it be almost dry, because you can see at this size, even the teeny tiny little lines, while they may look kind of clean and crisp from far away, they still do soak into the paper and bleed a little bit. So if you use too much water, that bleeding is going to be exaggerated and the line is going to kind of spread out and look all fuzzy and weird. So what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a wet brush, sorry about my head poking in there, but I'm just taking a wet brush and I'm not it's not super wet by the way it's again just barely it's wet but with most of the water squeezed out of it but there's no color in it and i'm just scraping it along the paper taking color away from my character and spreading it around on different elements of the painting and kind of adding some weird little distortions i just love that look i like kind of distorting the outline and pulling the character into smoke And now here I am finally using that gold to bring out the darkness and the shadowy form of my character. What works well here is that I also have a fairly solid background without much detail, so it doesn't hide the character. Kind of unlike Opling where the background was really textured, this one is pretty simple. Having a solid background of a contrasting color can be a big help. Though it's not always possible and in cases where you have a super detailed background and you're trying to put a clearly rendered yet small piece of information over that, we can go back to what I talked about in part one again about using values to bring out the character. In some cases, I might even recommend finding ways to minimize the background detail around your character or focal detail. Imagine you have a painting that involves a bunch of different elements of nature in it. Let's say that the biggest point is a woman dancing in some grass, and all around her are little animals. Let's say that you want to paint a baby bunny in the grass, and you know that bunny is going to end up being the size of your thumbnail. You're also worried because the grass is very detailed and might distract from the bunny. So you could do a couple of things to bring her out, such as making her a nice bright color, such as white, and having the grass around her be more shadowy and dark so that some of the detail of it is hidden. Doing that would kind of allow you to be able to focus in on the little bunny without having to add tons and tons of crazy detail to her 
because the whiteness of her body would contrast so well against the darkness of the grass and the green color as well. And that's what I mean about using a solid background or a shadowy or um, contrasting background to bring out your character. And the opposite would be true if you had a super dark character, obviously you would choose to maybe use a little bit of a lighter background to bring that character out or that detail out. When I say character, I'm basically referring to your main focal detail that you want to be viewed. So now I'm just going back in and adding a few more fun details as an afterthought and to make him little bit more interesting. I like to do things where I kind of build as I go. I don't always decide everything during the sketch. I like to leave decisions to be made later because it's more fun and I think it allows more freedom in the moment and keeps me from getting too rigid with my work personally. When I try to plan things out too too much from the start, sometimes it can lead to something really stiff, but if I don't plan at all, sometimes it leads to a really poor composition. Oh, finishing up the gold here, I have to mention that I kind of like things really smoky and ever dissipating, as I mentioned earlier. So I chose to bring some of that gold back into my character's body, which I feel also kept the character from looking so flat. This is a personal choice, but I always bring quite a lot of my background color back into my characters. And even if you don't want to do that as much as, as I do, I think adding a little bit of the background colors in the best shadows and highlights can create a sense of life and realism in its own right. And depending on how you go about it, it can give your art a unique style if you choose to really exaggerate the use of color in your shadows. And as always, I like to make it pop with some little white highlights, and I use a little bit of white gouache when I do these white highlights. You can use gel pen, which I don't usually use because it doesn't work well on most of the surfaces I paint on, and I don't get quite a fine enough line. So you can use gel pen, or you could even use like some acrylic ink or something, which might even be more opaque than this um, white gouache, which is still, as you can see, very transparent. And one thing to note is that it goes on fairly white and that it dries really transparent. So do be aware of that if you use white gouache for highlights. All right, on to part three. And as you could probably see, this little painting is the size of a dime, because I thought I would keep up with the money trend and that that would be kind of fun. Originally, when I was painting this little unicorn type creature, she was supposed to have an arrow in her side, and that's why you see this random little stick thing that I kind of end up drawing. But in the end, I felt that it was a detail that wouldn't translate well, so I actually left it out. And that brings me to one of my main points about painting really tiny things, and that is painting a simple design with just important details. A design that's too complex might not read easily, though it can still be a fun challenge. If you want something easier to read, go for a piece with one focal character. Even if the piece is a landscape, that character could be a mountain, rock, tree, or flower something to draw the eye to, an ambassador for the rest of the image, basically. Then, you can work to consciously build up a level of detail that translates. If you work slow, by the end you'll probably know the limits of your piece and be able to decide if you should really try to add a big highlight to that unicorn's eye, or if it will look strange. Fortunately here, I was happy with that decision, which you'll see at the end. I also went with a clear, easy to understand pose. With this unicorn, something that was wise to avoid for me was giving her a really confusing pose, such as a few from her direct front, or directly from the back, or even at any kind of super confusing angle that might look amazing and dynamic in a larger painting, but would probably be very confusing at this size. Plus, have you seen horses from the front? At this size, she would have looked like an egg. 
In addition to using these values to bring out the unicorn from the background because she's such a light color, I'm using those, you know, darker tones to really make her light coat stand out against them. I'm also making a little bit more use of lines than normal. I usually don't make a lot of use of obvious lines in my paintings, although one day I might like to experiment with that more because I love the look of it in some artists' work. But usually, I like to keep things fairly soft and cloudy. However, when doing small details, I personally find that lines are a wonderful friend and add a crisp feeling and keep it from looking like a blob. The bigger you go, I feel the less lines you need to use if you're trying to avoid them in your work. It was really fun painting at this size. It's obviously not the first time I've painted things at this size, but having a character kind of isolated at this size with no other larger painting around it was what made it so enjoyable, and I'd love to do more of this. It really reminded me of when I used to do little pendants and jewelry, which I never did a ton of or really completed because it just felt like what I shouldn't be focusing on at the time, but it's something I'd like to get back into. I also just like tiny art in general, and I think seeing tiny art in frames is particularly funny, and it's, so it's something I might like to do a little bit more of, like painting a tiny piece and then putting it in a big gaudy frame and seeing if anybody wants it, because I personally would buy that. I, I like things like that. So again, we're gonna throw on those super fun white highlights. Now, this unicorn is already white, so of course the highlights might not stand out as easily, except that I made sure not to make her body too bright, just for this purpose. This can be a fun way to challenge yourself to see how much detail you can fit while keeping the image clear. I was pretty happy with this, though I think I could probably go even further with it, so I might try that soon as a personal challenge, and if I do, I'll, I'll definitely film it. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I don't usually spend quite this much time on every single small detail in my paintings, and as with everything, the more you do, the faster you can go.
For example, I recently finished up a little piece for my upcoming show, Mountain Kalia, and all these smoky little ferret-like creatures were done fairly quickly because they were just very loose and free form, and the more I did, the more I was able to move through them at a fast pace. All in all, painting small details does take practice, and learning to get well acquainted with your medium. There are so many tiny flips of the wrist and twists of the brush I do, as I mentioned, to get those details looking clean and sharp. Just take your time, practice a lot, and don't feel bad if it doesn't go right at first. I think I've always loved fine detail, but I used to have a real problem with portraying it correctly, and everyone would look like one big blob by the end. Learning to know when less was more, how to add value and color to make things pop, and just developing muscle memory for those light touches and little twists of the brush took years and years, and of course, I'm still trying to improve. Once more, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask me. If you'd like to see me further explore any aspects of this video in a future video, do let me know. Be sure to vote on the poll for my May tutorial, and as always, take care of yourself. Painting fine details is very hard on your eyes, and so take breaks. It can also be hard on your hands, so be sure to stretch. And you know me, follow a clean diet with exercise if at all possible. Your mind and body will gladly repay you with better work. Thank you so much for the support, and thank you so much for watching and giving me the opportunity to do something so fun. I had a very good time, and I can't wait to make the next tutorial for you. Be well. Bye.